Hey everybody and welcome to Bits of Board, where we're talking board games, miniatures, cards and dice. My name's Michael and today we are checking out a game by the name of Colima. Now this is a really interesting video because I filmed this ages ago, never got around to filming the ins and outs, and it's just become a lost on the hard drive till now and I love the fact that I found it. So, um, I'm very excited to show this one off, obviously. <laughs> But I do have to thank boredom.com.au. These are the guys that lent this game over to me so I could review and uh, show off for all y'all out there. So if you're in Australia and you're looking for some cheap board games, definitely check out boredom.com.au. There's a link down in the comments somewhere. Check it out. All right. Um, for the moment, though, let's get straight back on track and talk about this game. So what is Colima? Well, this game is all about a gold rush in the wild, wild west, and that is so exciting for me. I love the Gold Rush games. I remember having a Gold Rush camp back in year three primary school. We went to a place called Birigai. We did some panning for gold. It was so much fun, and that excitement has transferred completely over to the board game side of things. All right, so it's not all about the gold mining stuff. It does have a settlement management aspect to it as well. Players are going to be helping develop the town of Colima. And um, aside from that sort of tableau building aspect, what we have here is a mighty fine point salad of a game with a really unique action selection element. Um, and I'll show you all of that in just a sec. Um, in fact, I'm going to show it to you right now. <laughs> Let's get in. Here we have the game board. In the center, we have the action wheel. And as this is an action selection game, this is going to be where a lot of the game is played. Now, surrounding that, we have various other landmarks associated with some of the actions that can be taken in the game. Firstly, in the bottom left, we have our year tracker. Top left, we have the map of the frontier land. Here, players will be moving their wagons across the land, gaining rewards on their trips to the different boom towns that are scattered across the board. Now, the rewards for traveling aren't that great, but arriving in one of the four boom towns provides great rewards, including dudes or tents. Now, dudes are a player's own cowboy pieces. They are actually called dudes in the game. And these will be spent a number of different ways throughout the game, most notably as a resource of building structures. Now, tents, the other reward, they too have their own uses, most notably actually here on the frontier map. Let's say a player has made it all the way to one of the boom towns, in this case, Hangtown. The player then unlocks the ability to place their tents, settling the frontiers out on the map. These, of course, grant victory points for the total number placed but they have other uses as well, which you'll soon discover. Next to the frontier lands, we have the shootout space where we place outlaws and our own dudes to defend against them. Here we also have the barrel rewards, which are powerful one-time abilities that players can use for their own benefit. Now this section goes hand in hand with the shootout charts randomly selected during setup. The first is used to determine the rewards and penalties for the first shootout, a second one for the second shootout, and finally the chart printed on the board will always be used for resolution of the final year's shootout. Top right, we have our gold supply where gold is taken as earned. It also reflects the current price of gold, because yes, gold is worth money, but we'll cross more on that later. Anytime gold is spent as a resource, it's not actually returned to the pool, and instead placed in this wonderful little cart, which is in turn returned to the supply at the end of the year. Here we have our supply of river tokens, as well as bridge tokens, which are randomly chosen during setup and represent different ways players can invest, personalizing their scoring methods come the end of the game. Now, as the standard with a lot of victory points games around the outside of the board, we have the victory points tracker. The player with the most of these at the end of the game is going to win. And a game of columnar itself, well, is going to last three years. Starting in the year 1848, the town of Colima is going to be beset by at least two outlaws. And after all players have completed their actions, a shootout is going to take place. 
after which we move on to 1849. Four outlaws set up outside of town, we have another shootout, and then the game finally concludes after the year 1850. It's after this final year of game that players are going to score most of their victory points. First from buildings, second from surveying rivers and building bridges, and third placing tents out on the frontier lands. But players will still gain some just by playing. Before we take a look at the game in depth, let's just finish our setup and take a quick peek at the player boards. Now, these are double-sided, the A side of each player board containing identical information, with the B side changing things up from player to player. Players should take an action selection dial in their player colour, a pioneer playing piece, two dudes and a tent, a horse which is used for movement across the frontier lands, and then a deck of building cards from which they will draw six, keeping four. Now, over the course of the game, players will be drawing a number of these cards, and discarding, playing them to build their town, but it's worth noting a few things about this deck. Firstly, whenever a player is instructed to discard cards from their hand, they may choose to either place them at the top or the bottom of the deck. There is no discard pile. One of the second important things to note is there is no hand limit, so it is highly encouraged for players to draw continuously, increasing the number of options they have in hand, allowing them to develop as they see fit. Now, this also has a second benefit in that any time a player is instructed to draw a card when they have none in their deck, they are going to gain a victory point. So it can be highly lucrative investing in a card drawing strategy. Now there's just a couple of other things here. Players will each take a lump of gold from the game supply, not from the stream supply printed on the board, and they will also gain two dollars. One player will be given the sheriff's badge as starting player, and the game is set to begin. Before we get into it though, there are just a couple of other things to take note of on the player board. Along the top, we have a spot for players to place any rivers they've surveyed, as well as any bridges that they have built, gaining the bonuses printed below. In the body of the board, we have a graveyard where a player will place any dead dudes that are killed during the shootout phase. These actually result in negative victory points come the end of game. Next long, we have reminders of the cost of building bridges and surveying rivers. Our lodge, where we keep our dudes and tents, and the stable down the bottom where we can have up to six horses in our supply. Finally, we have the beginning of our town tableau. Sutter's Mill over here can be activated in two ways. With a shovel action, the player is able to draw two cards, and with a barrow action, the player is able to take one gold from the river supply. All right, with the tour out of the way, it's about time we get into the actions. But before we do, I quickly want to show you the shootout phase because the resolution of this phase can be a determining factor in how a player spends their actions. Basically, each year, a number of outlaws are going to be placed in the outlaw space up top here. In three to six player games, we start with only two outlaws. Over the course of each year, players will have the opportunity to add their own dudes into the shootout. And during the shootout phase, we compare the size of the two forces. If forces are equal, or the outlaws have more, then the outlaws win the showdown. If on the other hand, the players have more collectively, well, the players win. Showdowns are resolved as per the printed values on the tiles randomly selected during setup, or in the case of the third year, the values printed on the board. These tiles showcase two different sets of scoring. Scoring undertaken if the players win the shootout or if the outlaws win. In this case, the player who placed the most of their dudes will gain the first player token, $6, and gain six victory points. Second place gains $4 and three victory points. Third place gains $2 and one victory point. And then any player who did not contribute to the shootout has one of their dudes killed placing them in the graveyard. So it is pretty important as players to collectively keep an eye on the outlaw threat. As I said, the initial number of outlaws placed is determined by the year, but players will have the opportunity to raise the stakes. Over the course of the game, players will be awarded powerful bonuses, being able to choose from any of the barrels present up there, now, these barrels contain anything from resource bonuses to granting one-off actions themselves, but whenever a player takes one, 
they must add an outlaw to the pool as directed underneath the token. Now, because we are set up and sort of running through a two player game, the outlaw setup differs slightly from the three to six player game. Firstly, instead of two outlaws, we place three. And then we're instructed to place three outlaws of a player's color not participating in the game. And these outlaws will remain there for the entirety of the game. Now, of course, all this talk will make so much more sense after we go through the actions. So let's get stuck in there. Here we have the action wheel, arguably the most exciting element of this game. This wheel contains five sites, which players will use to take their actions. There is a floating sixth site that is rotated over the course of the year and a bust marker, which will reduce the effectiveness of overcrowded activation spaces. Now, just to give you the gist before we take a look at the actions individually, over each of the five rounds of the year, the Barker tile will rotate, signifying which of the five rounds of the year we're in. Players will resolve the event associated with the round and then simultaneously and secretly select an action they want to take. Once all players have selected, they'll reveal their selections and place their prospectors down on the associated spaces. Next, in site order, from one all the way around to five, players will take the action of the site holding their prospector. This will always include an outer action and sometimes include an inner action. Here we can see the blue player has placed in space five where the inner action is bust. Now the bust marker is not exactly fixed, Let's say both our prospectors chose to take their actions at site number two. The bust marker would be rotated, covering up the interaction for the duration of the round. Once all actions are resolved, players take their prospectors back. The bust marker is returned to its space covering the signpost and the Barker board is rotated, signifying the beginning of a new round. Once all five rounds are completed, we have a shootout phase, a cleanup and move on to the next year. Right, so with all that out of the way, let's take a look at the different actions available to us over the course of a year. Site one allows us to take shovel and barrow actions. Here we can see our shovel action is to draw two cards from the deck and our barrow action is to gain one gold from the river. If a player had also built the stables, they would be able to take the shovel and barrow actions printed on the card as well. In fact, they would be able to take any printed actions once for every building they have. Site 2 allows players to survey rivers or build bridges. Site 3 allows the players to build town buildings, choosing a card from their hand and paying the resource cost depending on the action taken. For the outer circle one, we're using the hammer costs. For the inner circle, we are using the saw costs. Site 4 allows players to move their wagons across the frontier map, allowing one point of movement for each horse in the player's supply. Site 5 allows players to place their tents either on the frontier board or against the events associated with each round of the year. Each round, whenever an event is resolved, players will receive only the bonus printed unless they also have a tent against the event. In the case that they do, they'll gain the printed benefits twice. In addition to placing tents, players will be able to place any dudes they've gained over the course of the game in the shootout protecting the town of Colima. Players may either choose to place one, two, three, four, or five dudes in the shootout, so long as they have the required dudes in their supply and that that particular amount had not already been placed. Here, players would not be able to place three dudes in the shootout because that space has already been taken, leaving us one, two, four, and five. In our example, the blue player will just place two. Now, of course, we also have the floating action, which moves around over the course of the year. Here, the outermost action allows players to spend money to gain tents or gold to gain horses, converting any number of times at the rates printed. Here, $2 for each tent and one gold for each horse. The innermost action allows a player to take one of the barrel bonuses we mentioned earlier. The powerful bonuses that, while very beneficial to a player, increase the outlaw presence and the danger come the end of the year. Now we have one final action hanging around, and that is the signpost action. Now this can pop up here or in the barrel bonuses with the outlaws. In either case, it means the same thing. This action space would duplicate the action that the signpost is pointing to. In this case, a player making an action at site number four would be able to undertake the wagon action and a town building action using the saw, as this is what the signpost is pointing at. 
For barrels, it's the same thing. If a player were to take this barrel here, it would mimic the bonuses of the barrel to its left. Again, town building with saws. There it is, guys and gals, Colima. You're going to be mining for gold, building the settlement and defending it from those outlaws. How exciting! It's the wild, wild west, right? Now, what we saw there was just the basics of the game, but honestly, Colima comes with a number of different ways that it can be played, from the inclusion of different modules, variable player powers. This game covers replayability so damn well. So if the theme grabs you, it's definitely going to be a solid inclusion, especially if you're into those point salad games. Now, what do I mean by point salad games? Well, you've probably guessed it by now, but there are just so many different ways in this game that you can score victory points that you can pretty much do whatever you want. And while it does tend to pay off focusing your strength in a smaller number of areas, it doesn't stop you from trying different things in the game. And that, to me, is always very exciting. Uwe Rosenberg does it best, I believe, followed by probably Stefan Feld, but there are a number of great designers out there, and the Colomer design stands very high up with those. Now, speaking of gameplay, there are a few things that I want to take note of. First of all, that action selection mechanic is absolutely fantastic. It adds in this wonderful player interaction that with enough table talk, this can become half a bluffing game. Players are going to be saying, I'm going to do this action. I won't go there if you don't go there. And then everything blows up come the reveal. I love it. The way that the actions move and change every round of the game is also a wonderful element that really helps create interesting and tough decisions for the players every round. I really enjoy the tableau building aspect and the fact that hand size is not a limitation. That's a pretty cool thing to add into a game like this. And the fact that you're rewarded for getting through all of your cards. I mean, it's just another point scoring element, but it's new and it's something I haven't seen before, so I'm a big fan. Honestly, there is a lot of good going on in this game. There is one thing that I should make mention of, because this could be a make or break element for you guys out there, and that is the town defense, the bandit defense element. And while it does add this wonderful competitive community goal, it can be absolutely devastating if it's ignored. I like to describe it similarly to Agricola's or Agricola's, however you want to say it, feeding the family mechanic. Because all the while that you're enjoying all the other elements of the game, there's going to be this little aspect, a little voice in the back of your head saying, hey, are you defending the town yet? Are you defending it? Are you going to be able to do that or are you going to get crushed by the repercussions? Yes, it is another layer of the game, but the game already has so many layers. Did it need it? I'll let you guys decide that one. All I can say is that this is a wonderfully deep, highly replayable point salad of a game that if you don't have anything like it, this one is a serious contender for a spot in the collection. All right, guys and gals, that's pretty much it for me today. Uh, if you've enjoyed the video, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and do all the things that you guys can do to help this channel grow. But besides that, we are about done. So as always, my name is Michael. This is Bits of Board. We'll catch you next time. Squeaky chair.